Good night, everyone. Just want to acknowledge those who are on the platform thus far. I see Sister Lois Maxwell Johnson, Sister Loy. I see uh, Tracia Black saying good evening to everyone. Good evening. We're, we're going to get started in a little while. Let's see if we can have a few more persons coming on and then we'll just get straight into it. I want to acknowledge your presence thus far and say God bless you for it. Let's see Sister Takesha Thompson, Brother Garfield Davidson Jr. Both saying good night. Good night. Another Wednesday. I don't know, but brothers and sisters, the, the time is moving very fast. I can't believe it's Wednesday again already. Uh, it means that we're midweek, one more week. It means that come tomorrow, we would have moved into or moved closer into another weekend. But boy, we just have to try and get what we have to do done. Uh, do as much as we can with the time that we have because the time is really not waiting on us. Brother Junior Don Scott, good to have you with us again this evening. But I hope that boy you've been, you all have been trying to get as much done as possible. Because if you delay any at all, that's it. Good evening, Sister McIntyre. I see you there. Uh, no, Brother Scott, you didn't miss it unless you're working with uh, another time zone. But it's still 7.30 there about, out here. I don't know if you're one hour away in West Milan or, uh, or three hours away, but um, you're right on time, right on time. All right, so uh, presses are coming on. I see uh, not just Brother Scott, but um, I see is that Tanya Houghton. Uh, good night, Tanya. Good to see you on. Tanya is saying good night to everyone. All right, bless the Lord. So welcome everybody. Welcome. More persons are coming on. See Valerie Anderson Evans is on. Uh, good evening, Sister Nadine Simpson Patterson. Brother Delroy, Brother Floyd is on saying good evening. Uh, good evening, everybody. It is indeed another privilege and pleasure of mine uh, to uh, host this Bible study session, this teaching session uh, on this platform. We're truly grateful for a Facebook platform and for a YouTube platform uh, so that we, we, we are able to share the word. Uh, we really have no excuse. You know, social media, you know, the internet, it has given us a, a platform, a connecting platform, a communicating platform that no one can say we did not get the opportunity to share. Sister Dolores Bright, uh, good evening. See you watching. Brother Joel Henry is also watching from Fort Lauderdale. God bless you as you are coming on. Praise the Lord. It is good to see everybody. And uh, good to see, you know, people reaching out, people exchanging pleasantries, people just being very pleasant and very nice. We, we try our best to, to keep the platform uh, as human as possible. So it doesn't, it doesn't get too mechanical. 
right, or doesn't appear that way. So we utilize the resources that we have at our disposal and we, we, we make them work for us. I see Sister Revlin Anderson is watching tonight as usual. Uh, Sister Jasmine Henry, praise the Lord. God bless the Henrys, praise the Lord. Uh, I want to just say, uh, just before we go any further, uh, that uh, tomorrow, let me just move this out of the way and preadventure anybody else know of any birthday celebrations this week, you can just type it in so that we can give them a shout out and so that we can just wish them well. So tomorrow will be uh, the birthday for uh, a set of twins out of the Sandy Bay New Testament Church of God. I speak about Akeem and Akelia Campbell. And tomorrow they celebrate, I believe, their 18th birthday. And we truly want to pray God's blessing on them that they will will continue to grow from strength to strength and that the Lord will help them to achieve all that they set out to achieve in life. So God bless Akeem and Akilia as they celebrate their 18th birthday come tomorrow. So uh, again, if, if there's anybody else out there that is celebrating or will be celebrating or if you, if you know of someone else that will be celebrating, you can just let us know so we can celebrate with them and just give them a nice shout out from this platform. So uh, good evening again and welcome to those who are just joining to our Bible study session. Uh, we are uh, going back into the word of the Lord tonight and we thank God for giving us the opportunity uh, sparing our lives and for surrounding us with, with his grace and for allowing his mercy to go ahead of us that we can meet again in this fashion. Uh, we have a whole lot to give God thanks for. Uh, this is another day that we are almost and can almost say that we've lived to see it uh, uh, to, the, to the full extent we don't know what can happen in the next hour or so, but we trust God and we continue to give God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Praise the Lord. Also, uh, this uh, Saturday, there will be a Women's Ministries Prayer Conference. The annual Women's Ministries Prayer Conference will be virtual. Um, uh, uh, a, a, a display picture has been posted on, on the Facebook platform of the Sandy Bay New Testament Church of God. So you can, you can see it there with the information as it relates to uh, the Zoom uh, ID and password. They, they will begin at, I think, 9.30, somewhere there about. You can just check it, just the specifics or the details, uh, just to be clear. And I think they're going to finish by about 12.30. Uh, it should have been posted in the Ladies Ministries group as well. But Pradventure, you're not in that group. You can actually check out the details on the Sandy Bay New Testament Church of God Facebook platform. It has been posted there. And um, it, it is gearing up to be a very wonderful uh, prayer conference based on what they have lined up. Uh, via program so um, that's the route that we're going these days we don't know for how long we we long to to be with each other in in some different settings you know even where the church is concerned we are still able to meet as a church on a Sunday morning and and so we're thankful to God for that I heard that persons uh, have been asking if the new measures concerning public gatherings affect our Sunday morning services? And the answer to that is no, it does not. Uh, the church still has the, the leeway and, uh, and the latitude to, to entertain as many persons as our, our physical space will allow based on the measurements outlined by 
the government. So our, our morning services, Sunday morning services are still on for those who were concerned that the 15 is as it relates to any other service or gathering that the church is having to include those who we can entertain on the outside while service is going on. Should be no more than 15, right? So we still get the opportunity to meet together and for fellowship. But uh, for those who are still um, not so sure about coming out for the fellowship, you can still join us on this platform, Facebook platform, and, and also on YouTube uh, to enjoy the praise and worship and of course the word so uh please bear those in mind and know that the church is still on church still a keep right and when i say church i'm not just talking about sunday morning service i'm talking about all that that uh has to do with with the church and its its focus and its mission you know to the community and to the world I said on Sunday that it's the perfect opportunity that COVID has presented to us to get back to personal evangelism, right? And we have the platforms, we can reach out to individuals, whether uh, family members, it, it's always good to start there first. Family members, you have co-workers, uh, you have friends, you have acquaintances, you have people that you come across on a regular basis, whether virtually or in person. But we have an opportunity to get back to personal one-to-one -one evangelism, right? Because the church is, is not on holiday, right? And so members of the church should not feel that, well, this is COVID-19, so all our evangelistic efforts are out the window. No, we still have the main one that Christ would have commissioned to us. That is to go and to spread the gospel. To go don't mean that you have to go into the world, right? As in, in, in other geographic locations. Right in your very household, there are persons who need to hear the word of God. People who need the Lord. And so we have that opportunity to witness to them, uh, whether by, by uh, verbally sharing or, or just ensuring that you are living a life that can influence others in a positive way. In other words, people should be able to look at you, look at how you live, and, and seek to make that decision to be like you and to walk the path that you are walking on. So just to remind us that we are still called to do ministry in, in that personal way. And it is not just for the pastor or for the leaders, but it is for every citizen of the kingdom, every believer in Christ. Let's bow our heads together for prayer before we get into the studies. Father, we thank you for keeping us throughout this day. Lord, indeed, this is the day that you have made and we rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, irrespective of how fast the time appears to be moving, we know, Lord, that you are still in control and that, Lord, you, have still, you are still holding the church to that which you have commissioned us to do, that is to share the gospel, Lord, to those who need to hear it the most and to those who need to find you and accept and embrace you as Lord and personal Savior. Lord, will you empower us by the power of the Holy Spirit? Will you enable us, God? Lord God Almighty, to, to encourage us and to strengthen our resolve. Lord, to do that which you have called us to do. So, Lord, even as we embark on these studies in a bid to prepare ourselves further, we pray the leading of the Holy Ghost. Lord, that tonight, this evening, your people will be blessed your people will learn and your people's confidence lord would have been bolstered somewhat by the word as we delve into the gifts we pray that you would show us individually and collectively that which you have poured out into your church even in sandy bay and for persons in other locations belonging to other congregations 
Lord, that you would reveal to all of us that which you have blessed us with, the spiritual resources to do the work of the kingdom more effectively. So open up our understandings, open our hearts, make them receptive, and O oh Lord, teach us to do all that is in your word and apply your hearts to wisdom. Bless everyone on the platform. Bless everyone that will be watching on YouTube. Lord, be gracious unto us as we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So again, welcome. I see persons uh, from, from uh, different parts of the world. I see uh, our cousin Merle Williams Cannon, who is watching from New York. I, I see uh, Laverne and Celia Watson. You know, I, I see persons coming on. So I know that we have a wide cross-section of persons from, from uh, Canada, from, from the United States of America, right here in Jamaica, not to mention right over there in Sandy Bay, not Clarendon, but Hanover, the real Sandy Bay. Praise the Lord. Uh, greetings to all the brethren, the leaders, and members of the Sandy Bay New Testament Church of God. Yes, Merle is actually in New Jersey, not New York. Thank you very much for the correction, ma'am. I don't know why I'm always thinking New York, the tri-state area. Uh, sometimes it seems like one place, but uh, you are across the bridge where there will be no sorrow. Praise the Lord. That's Merle out of New Jersey. All right. So last week, we started uh, our study looking on the, the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit. And we started to, to frame it in an appropriate way, I feel, you know, just to allow us to understand what the gifts of the Spirit uh, are, what they represent. And I think that uh, what we came across was that the gifts of the Spirit uh, cannot be produced by us, right? We do not have such power, but they are of a divine nature, meaning that these, as a matter of fact, just how it's coined, gift, right, suggests that these are items that are given to us, and Jesus Christ himself gave these gifts unto men, men there being generic, speaking about the body, the church, uh, to include not just men uh, gender-wise, but women and children. So they are of a divine nature and origin, and so we must bear that in mind. The gifts of the Spirit are also given uh, in accordance with the grace of God, right? And so we do not get to determine which gift or gifts we get, right? We simply... Pray to God and the Lord based on what he sees in us, right? Whether by natural talent or, or abilities, then I feel that the gifts are, are presented to us accordingly. So we, we also must remember that the gifts are to be used to edify the body of Christ, right? The gifts were never intended for anyone to to set up a shop out by the street side there to make some money. No, the gifts are for the body of Christ. So the utilization of the gifts are to benefit the body, right? And uh, it is clear that others can see the use of the gifts or the gifts in action and come to know the Lord as Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, right? It is clear. But just to let us, or just to remind us that these gifts are for the edification of the body of Christ. It is, these gifts are to, to aid in the maturity, in the growth and development of the church. And we must never ever forget that, right? So, so these gifts are of particular importance to the church and and where we are not seeing the manifestation of the gifts, then uh, we, we need to be concerned. And the concern is not one that will drive us to worry in, in any sense of that word, 
but it should be one that drives us to pray, to fast and to pray and to seek God, you know, to ask God to reveal to us. And he will, as he has done in, in so many times before, you know, to ask him to reveal to us, to show us that which he has blessed his church with, that which he has placed within me and within you, right? Of particular importance, right? Every believer has been given at least one gift. Every believer. So no one has any excuse to sit on the sidelines. You know, you, you, you're not a substitute, right? You're not waiting for your turn, you know, for someone to be taken out so you can get your turn, right? No, every one of us have been given at least one gift. Some of us, we are blessed to have more than one, and it is possible that we can have more than one. No one can have all of them because that person, it might get to their heads and, and, and they might think that they have become little demigods or mini-gods or gods. So, uh, but at least one gift would have been given to every believer. And as I said last week, if, if you are unable to identify that gift, then one of two things. Either you need to pray to the Lord more for him to reveal that gift or those gifts to you, or you might need to go back to Calvary, right? So, so once you, you have surrendered your life to the Lord and you become a child of God, good night, Sister Raquel Henry, from uh, uh, Raquel Henry Rose, rather, from the K Valley New Testament Church of God in Hanover, right? So once you have been uh, saved by the grace of God, you are now a part of the family of God, a part of his body, then you have been guaranteed at least one gift. What it means is that every one of us can do something. None of us should sit back and say, well, I'm going to watch everybody else because they are the talented ones, they are the gifted ones, and I have nothing, so I'll just sit back. If you, if you feel as if you're not able to manifest or you're not experiencing uh, or seeing any semblance of a gift, then I recommend strongly that you begin to ask God in a serious way to reveal this to you because by virtue of being a part of the body of Christ it means that you have at least one all right so we looked at uh, the design of the gifts because our God is a God of order right and I feel that this is where we're falling down as a church over the years because we have not been paying attention to the appropriation of the gifts. The gifts were given to the church to be used in a particular way. Uh, specific purposes, right? Uh, specific context, right? All of these, right, must be taken into consideration. So the, the point about design is that they're not supposed to be used in any haphazard way or abused because sometimes that is what happens. We abuse the gifts, right? And, and we, we sometimes uh, uh, take credit, right? And sometimes that's what we're looking for. We, we want people to recognize us, so we try to abuse the gifts, right? But then on the flip side, sometimes we have people who are neglecting the gifts and the gifts can be neglected. Right, so some persons who are saying they are not sure what gift or gifts they might have, it's not a case where you do not know, it's a case where you are possibly neglecting the gifts. For others, it might be a case where you are looking at the giftings of others and you're thinking to yourself, I wish I could be like that, or I wish I could do that. When God has his own work for you to do, right? But you might not be seeing your task as, as, as great as somebody else's. The, the aim is not to be looking at what others can do, but to try and discover what is it that God has placed within you that you can use. Even if it means staying in your little corner or in your little tent, 
and allowing God to use you to benefit his people, right? So, so it is for us to, 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 to ask God to lead us. And as God revealed these gifts to us, then we seek to use them to the glory and honor of God. And, and, and that is another parameter concerning where the gifts are concerned, right? That we must observe. We do not get to manifest the gifts so that we can big up ourselves and puff up our chests and, you know, and, and elevate our shoulders and, you know, no, we, we are, we're not in this thing for any, any self-aggrandizement, right? This is not about uh, how many, how many upmanships we can get and how many pat on the shoulder we can get and how many applaud and accolades that we can get. No, it's about giving glory to God, right? If the gifts are of divine origin and, and nature, then it means that once these gifts are manifested through us and in us, then it means that all glory belongs to God. We have nothing to do with the gifts in terms of the manifestations of the gifts. We don't get to manifest at will. Right? No, we don't. I know that some of you can speak in tongues at will, but we practice what the Bible says, as the Spirit gives utterance. Right? You, you didn't know that. I wonder if, I wonder if you all don't knew that. That we have persons that they can speak in tongues at will. You know, anytime. They, they know the tongues. They, 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 can, they can let it out anywhere they want. Right? But that's not the case. We seek to give God glory in everything. So those who can recognize that this has nothing to do with me, right? Self, self is, is on the back burner here, right? And this is all God. Then we will, those are the persons who will inevitably give all glory and all praise to the God who gives the gifts in the first place. Praise the Lord. I want to recognize the Grahams. I see Sasha Graham. I know I saw uh, 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 Sister uh, Graham uh, earlier, another Sister Graham from Sandy Bay, you know, earlier that you're on, Sister Judith Douglas, who celebrated her birthday last week, Wednesday, and I did not recognize until afterwards, so I'm saying to the platform tonight, before I forget, happy belated birthday to Sister Judith Douglas. God bless you. All right. So this evening, we're going to be looking at um, the, the actual gifts, right? And uh, the, these gifts, of course, just to let you know, uh, can be found in Romans chapter 2, verse 6 to 8. 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 to 10. And First uh, Corinthians, and sorry, and First Corinthians chapter twelve, same chapter, uh, verse twenty-eight to thirty, as well as Ephesians four and verse eleven. So we're going to be looking at at, at these passages um, as we go along. We're going to be moving back and forth, right, just to recognize uh, the gifts as as they are identified in these passages. Right and 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 uh, also where they're referenced in other parts of the Bible, right? So the first gift that I want us to zero in on this evening is the gift of administration, and of course it's going to be in alphabetical order, right? The gift of administration, administration. Yes, sis, Sister Lesume Graham, praise the Lord. I hope I got the pronunciation of the first name correct. Praise the Lord. All right, so good to have you with us. And I, I trust that uh, Brother Graham is watching as well. All right, so gift, the gift of administration, right? And uh, this is a critical gift for the church, right? I mean, any organization, any organization needs administration, Right, without administration, you find that everything will be uh, out of whack, and confusion will 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 be all around, and people will not be sure what's going on, what to do. People will not be sure 
uh, what role they play and so on. So every organization needs administration. It is, it is administration that ensures that structures are put in place and, 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 and uh, ensure that a chain of command is observed and protocols are observed and so on. Without administration, you will have chaos, right? Because then everybody will seek to do whatever it is that they want to do or feel like doing. So administration is critical for the church. And, and we know that it is, it is God who is in charge of the church, but then the physical structures and, and, and functioning, right, the physical setup of the church will also need some amount of administration, right? Yes, Brother Graham, good evening. I see you there, and, and, and Matthew is with you as well. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, oh, Matthew, that's Matthew Graham, Gregory Graham. Praise the Lord. Good to have you. So we need to have uh, administration. And, and, and this is something, an element or a gift that has been given by God to the church. Right? Now, administration uh, comes from a Greek word, which, which is a unique term. I won't be pronouncing the words, but, but just to give you uh, the root meanings of them. Right? So it's a unique term that refers to a shipmaster or a captain. Right? And, and I think you can get even from the word captain. Once you hear captain, captain suggests somebody that's in charge, someone that, that, that can organize, someone that gives instructions, right? Someone that is in leadership. Right? So, so that's the word or that's the root meaning of the original Greek word for administration. The literal meaning is to steer, right? I want you to understand the, the, the meaning of this word. It, it is to steer or to rule or govern. It carries the idea of someone who guides and directs a group of people towards a goal or destination, right? So if you look at a, a passage like for example Acts chapter 27 and verse 11 you recognize this is this is a, a, a passage that relates uh, to uh, Paul being shipwrecked but just before they left the harbor Paul was warning that there's danger ahead right and he was warning the centurion and warning the others right the centurion who would be the high-ranking officer right ignored Paul instead and listened to the shipmaster or the captain who said that everything was okay for sailing. It so happened that later on there was a storm and the, the boat sank, it was shipwrecked, right? Thank God not every, you know, nobody was hurt, those who stayed on board as Paul instructed, right? However, the, the point that I want to raise is that the centurion overlooked Paul. Because he didn't recognize Paul as a seaman, someone who, who had experience at being at sea and operating or maneuvering ships. So the centurion overlooked the apostle Paul with all his spiritual arguments and instead listened to the shipmaster, right? Because the shipmaster was the one who was in charge. So people with the gift of administration, right, they tend to, to always be able to guide and direct a group of people toward a goal or destination. They seem to have the know-how, the expertise, right? You know, with, the gift, with this gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, individuals are enabled to, to, to organize, right? It's not everybody, and this is why it is a gift, a specific gift given to specific people, right? So these individuals are usually able to organize. They are able to direct and implement plans to lead others in the various ministries of the church, right? So, so, so as pastors, right, we must understand that this gift exists within the churches and not think that we are the only ones that can 
administrate in the church. There are churches nowadays, uh, especially in first world countries, that they have a side, uh, the pastor's side, they have, or notwithstanding, they have a, a, an official administrator of their church. And usually these individuals normally display the skill sets of an administrator, right? Not that this is what they do for a living uh, in the secular field, right? But that they recognize that the Spirit of the Lord is upon them and they are able to administrate, to direct, to organize and implement plans to lead others. And so pastors are wise, you know, to recognize these individuals. I'm going to be telling you the truth right here. I wouldn't want to have to run a church all by myself. That would be suicide, right? One of two things will happen. Either I would burn out and die, right? Or people would become disillusioned and feel that, well, you know what? I can't stay here because here is a pastor who insists on doing everything his way and his way alone. And sometimes as pastors, we may not be gifted with this gift of administration, right? But, you know, I don't feel a way. I mean, I'm the pastor of the church. If there are persons who can do a good job at organizing, at, at implementing plans, at putting things in place, structuring, structuring uh, items and programs and so on, right? Then I am always going to be willing to allow those individuals the platform to do what God has blessed them with to do. So, brothers and sisters, we need to, to identify, be able to identify this gift within ourselves and within others. For we, 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 we may notice persons who they're just always well organized and they always want to ensure that everything is put in place that the mechanisms or the mechanics right are everything is running right you know everything is set everything is in place they're asking questions crit critical questions as it relates to the organization either of the church or a program of the church right you 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 recognize this in yourself or in others it could be an indicator right that you have or you may have this gift of administration right so so we need to be on the lookout right there are persons yes who may have studied in this field right not that that would know allow that person to become qualified where the church is concerned but it is a valuable asset. And then we recognize that persons can, can structure, they can, they can organize, they, they, they are good at, at implementing plans, they are good at uh, 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 putting plans together and organizing programs and you know, facilitating all different kinds of activities. right? And so these are the individuals that we must seek to identify, we must seek to uh, uh, affirm this gift on their lives and put them in the positions to utilize this gift of administration. I know that even in the Sandy Bay Church, some persons there might have this gift and are hiding, neglecting the gift, may be willing to use it in a secular field, but not necessarily in the church. I want to call you out. Maybe you might be out there belonging to your own church, wherever your location. And you know, you have been dodging. You know that things are not running right. And you, you get that feeling. You sense it deep in your spirit. You know what to do. You know what can be done to allow uh, an efficient flow of activities and programs. You know how the church's programs can be so structured for better organization and presentation, but you are staying aside probably saying, no sir, that's not me. I'm not gonna say anything because I am not one of the leaders 
or I'm not in charge, you know, or I am nobody, right? Well, you are, if you feel that way that you're nobody, then you are the right person that God is looking for, for the task. God is not looking for somebodies. God is not looking for self-made leaders and administrators. God is looking for people who will humble themselves, but who recognize that things can be better structured for more efficiency in the operation of the church, right? So I want to call out some people tonight and let you know that this gift has not been given to you to sit on it, but for you to utilize it. It's a gift that is closely related to the gift of leadership. But the difference between the gift of leadership, which leadership is more general, right? And, and the gift of administration is that administration is more goal or task oriented, right? And is also concerned with specific details and organization. Leadership is, is more in a broader sense. Right, because you can be called, I can be called to leadership, but not necessarily to administrate. So, as the leader, I now must recognize those who are administrators and those with that gift and put them in the positions and empower them as the, the, the pastoral leader, right, or as the leader of the team, right, because it could be that you are a leader of, of a specific group. But it doesn't mean that you have all, all the, 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 the facets and you, 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 you don't have all, all that is needed to organize and to structure everything. It would be good for leaders to recognize when they have administrators around them and put them to task. Right? So, uh, Titus was recognized as, as, as an administrator. The gift itself is referred to in, in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28, right? Let's, 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 let's identify it together. I want you to recognize that it is there as a gift. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28. And it says... And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with the gifts of administration, right? So I want you to make a note of it that it is listed, right, in the Corinthian listings as being a gift of of the spirit but then also uh you look at uh, titus chapter 4 sorry titus chapter 1 and verse 4 to 5 titus chapter 1 and verse 4 to 5 it says to titus my true son in our common faith grace and peace from god the father and Jesus Christ, our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete, and I'm reading from the New International Version, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Directed you. So it is very clear that Paul is the apostle. Paul is the leader right but paul recognized that there was something in titus that would have allowed him to leave titus with specific instructions to administrate the affairs of the church right so the leader will will will, will give the broad instructions right or will get that vision right but the leader will also allow the administrators Right, those with a compulsion or with a knack for implementing plans, for organizing, for directing, for for identifying uh, people with specific skill sets and put them in specific areas or give them specific tasks. 
the wise pastor would, would do something like that. And the Apostle Paul did that. He left Titus in Crete and he gave him the very reason why he left him there. So that he could administrate the affairs of the church. So I want us to keep this gift in mind, right? And recognize for those, the officers that are on, you know, Brother Jackson and Sister Patterson and, and uh, brother, brother Thompson, persons that I saw earlier. You know, I want us to, to truly consider this gift of administrations and recognize that there are persons within the church, right? And, and for the broader platform, within, within the, the churches that can actually administrate and help to organize the affairs of God's church. It is a bona fide gift and we must pray to God for this gift to be manifested in his church so his body of people can mature and can grow to higher heights in Jesus Christ. The gift of administration. The second gift that we're going to look at this evening is the gift of apostleship. The gift of apostleship. And I know, brothers and sisters, that this is a term that has been used quite loosely in, in, in this modern day and age. As a matter of fact, we have so many self-acclaimed uh, uh, apostles, right? And some might not even understand the, the terminology itself, but it, it, it sounds prestigious, you know, to be called an apostle, right? It, it gives you a sense of being in charge and and just 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 overseeing everything and you know people now need to kiss the ring on your finger no well we won't go that far right but it has a prestigious ring to it and so a number of persons would have employed or taken on to themselves this moniker this 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 title as it were right and say that they are apostles right uh, really it is God who ultimately determines who becomes what. But as a people, we can look at how, how others, uh, especially those who like to take on these titles, these, these self-acclaimed and self-trained and self-educated individuals like to take on these titles. It, it would be interesting, you know, just to note how they live, how they operate, to see if it falls in line with the word of God. Now, the spiritual gift of apostleship is, is sometimes confused with the office of apostle. So there is a distinction, right? So the, the gift, the spiritual gift is different. The, the spiritual gift of apostleship is different from the office of apostle, right? The office of apostle was held by a limited number of men chosen by Jesus, including the 12 disciples and also the Apostle Paul. Let's look at it together. I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 3. St. Mark chapter 3. Let's, let's, we, we just want to be able to identify and make a note of, 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 of the Apostles. Right, St. Mark chapter 3, and we're going to be reading from verse 13 to 19. St. Mark chapter 3, reading from verse 13 to 19. Sword in hand, all right, charge. All right, so the NIV reads, verse 13, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, uh, designating them apostles, right? You see, uh, 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 designate, this is the NIV though, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed, Simon to whom he gave the name Peter. So we're naming the apostles now, right? 
uh, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Bohanerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, not Andrew Holness, no. Andrew, <laughs> Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So th th those were the original 12. Later on uh, in the book of Acts, after uh, Judas committed suicide and uh, they had to select another individual to replace him, Matthias, right? The lot fell on him and he became uh, the replacement for Judas Iscariot, right? So, so these were the 12, right? And then to confirm Paul, you, you know Paul's story, right? On the road to Damascus, how he was uh, uh, confronted by Jesus and he received this call, right? And this is confirmed uh, more than one, in more than one uh, passage or scriptural references, right? But let's just look at Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, it says, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So Paul identifies himself as an apostle, one who was called by Jesus and sent in a specific way, right? So these are the only individuals, according to the scriptures, who would have held the office, no, no, not the gift, no, no, but the office of an apostle, right? And so the next time you hear someone identifying themselves or, or referring to others as apostle, you need to find out, you know, which apostle are you specifically talking about? Is it because the individual has the gift of apostleship or are you saying that this individual holds the office of apostle, right? The requirements for the office of apostle, and here are the requirements now, the requirements for the office of apostle included being a faithful eyewitness of Jesus' ministry and his resurrection, right? And, and uh, in, 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 in Acts chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, this is where the apostles, after the death of, of, of Judas Iscariot, right, they had to select another, or they had to select a replacement for Judas the betrayer, right? And so they made the, 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 they acknowledged the specific requirements in Acts chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Let's look at it together, right? Because I want to straighten out this office of apostle, right? As opposed to the gift of apostleship. And we're going to look at the gift, but I just want us to be clear on the office. So let's go to Acts chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Right. So it says, Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time. Right? So you see the first requirement? Whoever was going to be chosen had to be someone who would have been with the disciples of Jesus the whole time that they were with Jesus. Right? The Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Right? So let's read it again for context. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Right? Verse 22. Beginning from John's baptism. So you see how far back they went? Right? They went back three years. Right? They went back three years. So from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. So from his water baptism to his ascension, whoever was going to fill that slot 
as the 12th apostle to replace Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, right? That individual had to have been not a part-time witness of Jesus Christ, but a full-time one. One who was with them from the baptism of Jesus to the very ascension where they were looking up, standing, gazing until the angels spoke to them about what they were doing. Right? So the requirement is clear. You would have had to or you would have to have been a witness of Jesus Christ to be considered as, as an holder of the office of apostle, right? And in first, let's look at first Corinthians 9 and verse 1 as well. First Corinthians 9 and verse 1. Paul says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Paul is outlining here his rights of an apostle. He would have seen Jesus, right? Not just, not just in any superficial way, but he got his call to be an apostle from Jesus himself. So that would, that would have been the third requirement or a third requirement to be considered as a holder of the office of apostle, right? So you would have, you would have, you would have had to uh, 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 been with Jesus, been with the disciples from the beginning. You would have had to have, have received a personal call from the Lord you know, a revelation that, that is unquestionable, right? And you would have had to have been an eyewitness to all the things that Jesus would have done. I don't know anybody today who can actually say, I have those requirements under my belt. I wasn't there when Jesus was baptized. I wasn't there at the ascension looking up with all the other disciples right and i didn't receive a call like the apostle paul to the office of apostleship the apostles were given authority by jesus to do the many different things to establish uh, the church including writing scripture right and performing miracles Right? These are, are, are activities that, that have been outlined in the scriptures. John 14 verse 26, 2 Peter 3 verse, verse 15 uh, to 16, and 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. Right? But especially uh, uh, the 2 Peter 3 passage. Let's, let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3. As we look at the, the authority of that was given by Jesus to the apostles to do uh, uh, various things in the church, right? Second Peter, and here we go with the Peters again. Now, it's a real Peter I'm talking about now from the scriptures, not the political one or the political ones, right? So Second Peter uh, chapter three and verse 15 and 16, the NIV reads, bear in mind, that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. So Peter is attesting or affirming the fact that the very writings of Paul would be enough to establish him as an apostle based on the authority that Paul was given by Jesus Christ to write the scriptures, right? And when you look at the New Testament, 
I mean, to internet distortion, right? But 75% of the New Testament writings were written by the Apostle Paul. So some of the disciples, you know, they wrote material, right? But when you look at the extensive writings of Paul, you cannot write Paul off as having distinct claims to being a holder of the office of apostle, right? And all the other gospel writers and those who were eyewitnesses and those who were scribes, those who were given dictations, right? Like, like Luke, who wasn't a disciple, or who wasn't an apostle, but he was uh, uh, given the material to write and was able to do so based on his experience as a doctor and, and as a faithful follower of the disciples of Jesus Christ, right? So there are no more uh, uh, orders of the apostle, the office of apostle today, right? Let's put it another way. The office of the apostle is closed, the office of the apostle is closed. There are no more holders of that office today. And I know that maybe not everybody will agree with me because you might have an apostle that you show great respect to that individual and you hold that person in high regards, right? I am not questioning apostleship as a gift, but I am challenging apostleship as the office of the apostle right so there are no more that hold the office of apostle today but the gift of apostleship continues in a different sense so it is the gift of apostleship that we must seek to understand right for the gift of apostleship continues in a different sense in our church today Jesus gave some apostles, he gave some prophets, he, he gave some evangelists, he gave some to become pastors and or shepherds and teachers at his ascension. And it is confirmed in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse uh, uh, 11 and 12, right? So there is a gift of apostleship, but the office of apostle. As it was ordained upon the original 12 and then the addition of Mattathias and on the Apostle Paul, that office is closed. But the gift of apostleship is still alive in the church of God today. Now, the apostles or those having the gift of apostleship do not have the authority to write scripture right nor are, are to adjust the scriptures right in any way shape or form so not because you feel you're an apostle it does not give you the right to alter or to change any aspect of the scriptures nor can you write any further scripture for the canon of scripture is also closed that's it right so those having the gift of apostleship must know their role and not try to take on activities that they were never ever called to take on. Now, I want you to understand what the apostle is called to do, right? So the apostle, having the, those having the gift of apostle, our apostleship, right, have a different purpose in the sense of establishing the church right you know they have a role to play in terms of church planting but the church itself would have already have been established by those holding the office of apostle right uh, don't get, get it confused no, no. right Jesus is the the the, the, the foundation on which the church is laid. Jesus is Lord of the church, right? But the apostles, those who followed him and were ordained by him and called by him like the apostle Paul, 
are the ones who pioneered the expansion of the church and ensured that the church spread across the then known world. So the foundation has already been set. So we don't need nobody to, to, to build a new foundation. The foundation has already been set. So the mission for those with the gift of apostleship today is to plant new ministries and churches to go into places where the gospel has not yet been preached, to reach across cultures, to establish churches in challenging environments, to, to raise up and develop leaders. And that is critical, right? Because you can't be planting churches, right, without leaders to put in them. And leaders must seek to, to put a, a succession planning in place to ensure that when you go or when you have to step aside, the ministry does not die with you, right? So those with the gift of apostleship, must also be involved in the development of leaders. And that is why apostleship is listed as a gift of, of which uh, 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 the church itself should be edified. Right? So it is out of this gift, right, that leaders within the church should be identified, should be trained, uh, or prepared to become leaders themselves. Right? It is part and parcel of the gift of apostleship, right? Those with the gift of apostleship, right, are, are also uh, there to, to call out and lead pastors and shepherds and much more. It, it's really not an exhaustive list because the gift of apostleship is a critical gift to the church, right? So they, they often have many different gifts that allow them to fulfill their ministry. So the person with the gift of apostleship, right, usually are, are leaders of leaders or ministers of ministers. They are influencers, right? They are typically entrepreneurial and are able to take risks and perform difficult tasks. Missionaries, church planters, certain Christian scholars and, and institutional leaders, right? And those leading multiple ministries or churches often have the gift of apostleship. Again, not to laud yourself or over others, right? But to understand the gravity and, 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 and uh, how critical your role is. You become the leader of leaders. You become the pastor of pastors. You become the minister of ministers, right? And you are in a pole position or a critical position to help in the development of other leaders, right? So those who are calling themselves apostles, you need to be planting churches, right? You need to be exploring the missionary front, Right, going out there and ensuring that the word of God is being spread and that people who are being saved have a place to call home and, and have leaders to help them to grow and to develop. Right? So the office itself, while it might be an office of prestige, but it is an office that calls for great maturity and a sense of purpose and a sense of the call of God. And knowing exactly what God has called you to do and to ensure that you are doing it. Right? So, again, you look at Ephesians 4 and verse 11 and you recognize that the gift of apostleship is mentioned there. You look at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28 and you will notice that Paul also recognizes the gift of apostleship which was outside of what he was doing. That is Paul the apostle for he held the office but he recognized that there were others, certain leaders within the churches that would have manifested the gift of apostleship. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I wish that we were face to face so that, because I know that persons might have some questions that they would want to ask, right? But if, if you do, 
uh, note that you can text the questions in and whether or not I can uh, answer them, if I can answer them uh, tonight live, then I will do so, right? If they come in later on, then I will just answer them on the Facebook platform. But brothers and sisters, this is very interesting, very interesting, right? But let's bear in mind the distinction between the office of the apostle and those having the gift of apostleship, right? The third and final gift that we're going to look at this evening. So we've looked at the gift of administration and we're going to be praying that the Lord will uh, enlighten such individuals or reveal such individuals to us, right? And also make it known to them in a, in a, in a, in a real impressive way so that they can't resist that it will be manifested within the churches. And also, there is the gift of apostleship. And we may have persons in our midst that God would have given such a gift to, to be raised up, to become a leader of leaders, a pastor of pastors, uh, a minister of ministers, to help train and develop and send forth persons to do ministry. Right, So we're going to pray about that one as well. And then the third one that we're going to look at tonight, and the final one for, for, for this evening, uh, is the gift of discernment. The gift of discernment. And the spiritual gift of discernment is also known as, and I think more contextually put, the gift of discernment of spirits. Right? Because sometimes people confuse discernment with prophecy, right? Or, or that which comes in a, under a prophetic order, right? And so people think that the gift of discernment uh, means you are able to take somebody's hand and, and see what is happening in their lives, right? That, that's not discernment. That's not the discernment that we're talking about at all. The discernment that we're talking about here as a gift is more appropriately coined discernment of spirit. Spirits, right? The gift of discernment of spirits, right? Or distinguishing between spirits, right? So that's what the gift is for, to distinguish between spirits. And the Greek word for the gift of discernment is a word that describes being able to distinguish, to discern, to judge or appraise a person, a statement, a situation, or environment, right? Because any one of those uh, 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 situations or mentioned a while ago, right, could either be good or bad, could either be of God or of the devil. So when you talk about uh, it could be a person, the person might just not be right. The person might just be off and, and everybody may not notice or others may not notice. But you find that there is something within you <coughs> that, is, that is very, very pointed and very, very clear you know, or, or clarifies within your mind and spirit that that person is just not right. Yes? Uh, you, 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 you see, you can see in the, from the initial stage that this is a gift that we need to pray for in a significant way in the church, right? Because oftentimes there are persons that will come into our churches that brothers and sisters, they're just not right. And you sense within your spirit. And I'm not talking about those who are quick to say that, boy, you know, my spirit just agree with him. Right? Because sometimes we hear things about people. Sometimes we know things about people. Right? You know, sometimes we have our pre-knowledge about an individual. Right? And then other times, sometimes we have people who just get bad mind. <laughs> right? And, and so, you know... You, you may not you may not like what the person is wearing because what they have one look better than yours. So all of a sudden there's a something about him that my spirit just can't take. That's not what we're talking about, you know. Right? We're talking about being able to genuinely distinguish 
between righteousness and unrighteousness, right spirits and wrong spirits, right? We're talking about understanding that sometimes when people make statements in church, even upon reading from the Bible or, or interpreting the scriptures, sometimes people will make statements that are not biblically correct in terms of the interpretation or might make false statements concerning the word of God. And we need the discerners of spirits to be alive, to be active. So that when people begin to talk foolishness, you are able to stand up and say, uh, 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 uh. Hold it right there, brother. Hold it right there, sister. Something is off about what you are saying or what you have said. Sometimes too, it may be a situation Sometimes it might be uh, an environment. You go somewhere, Sister Jasmine Henry, and everything seems right. Everything about where you are looks okay. It appears to be okay. But there's something inside your spirit, deep on the inside, that is telling you something is off about this place. And you need to move promptly or hastily to get out of there. Right? But and somebody's going say, but why? There's nothing wrong. We're just having a good time. Good people are here. And we're all good and it's all love. But you just know from you got there that something is wrong about this place. We need this gift. Yes? It is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 10 again. As a bona fide, genuine gift of the Spirit that we must pray to God for it. Now, the Holy Spirit gives the gift of discernment to enable certain Christians to clearly recognize and distinguish between the influence of God, Satan, the world, and the flesh in a given situation. And brothers and sisters, it is, it is sad and unfortunate, but listen, sometimes there's a thin line between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. And there are persons who sometimes start out genuinely in the spirit, somewhere along the line, go off into the flesh, but still think that they're in the spirit. We need persons with the discernment of spirits, the gift of discernment of spirits, Spirits to be able to, 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 to look at some things that are happening in the church and say, hey, something is not righteous about this. Something is off. Something isn't right at all. We need this in the church. The church needs those with this gift to warn believers in times of danger or keep them from being led astray by false teaching. Oh Lord, we need it. We need it. And I remember a friend of mine telling a story uh, of, of something that happened at a church, you know, uh, where the, a young lady was given the opportunity to sing. It was a Sunday night service. And, and so... You know, it was a Sunday night. The young lady wasn't, is not really a Christian, wasn't really a Christian, but it's a Sunday night service, you know, people are testifying and, you know, so on. So they allowed her to express herself in singing. And, you know, I'm told that she started to sing. And she was singing so well. You know, they said that boy, she had the voice of an angel, right? And, you know, she was singing and wooing the people and everybody, they were literally eating out of, she had them eating out of her hands. And it's like everybody was just caught up in a trance, right? Just so caught up with this beautiful voice and beautiful singing. And the individual told me that, that she sensed that something was off and she was looking around wondering if, if nobody was feeling the same way. That something wasn't right about it. 
you know, and she said she went up to the pastor and told the pastor that, boy, she sensed that something is off. You know, as pastors, sometimes, it's not all the time we're in the spirit. You know, it's not everything that we are going to see. So the pastor brushed it off and said, well, it's Sunday night, man, and she's doing well. And she said, no, she began to pray because she said something was off. And then she recognized that other persons picked up on it now and they started to pray as well. And the next thing they know, the beautiful voice turned into a distorted voice that said that boy, she not leaving. And she has nowhere else to go. And that, when they rec that was when they recognized that this was someone who was actually under the influence of, of, of evil spirits. So you see, evil spirit right up there a sing gospel song singing christian songs and everybody was just caught up not recognizing that something was off brothers and sisters this is why we need the gift of discernment of spirit in the church because sometimes we we, we end up listening to the beautiful voice and the beautiful speaking. And sometimes when especially false prophets and false teachers, when they begin to speak, if you're not careful, your sugar, your blood sugar will go up because it's like it's sugar coming out of their mouths and it tastes nice. And you just can't get enough. But we need some individuals that will be in touch with the Spirit of God that will be in line with the Word of God. And please note why I am, I am qualifying this because we need to ensure that we are at the right place with God before we start distinguishing between spirits. Because let me just pause here to say that sometimes it's not the other people that might be off. It could be you. So we need people who will stay in touch with God, people who will stay in touch with the word, and people who will be able to control their emotions and not get carried away because, you know, your spirit not take that person there. That's not what we're asking for. We're talking about people who will genuinely sense that there is an evil presence or that there is a false spirit at play or that something is wrong with this environment or something is wrong with the statement that is being made or that was made and will make a note of it and will seek to do something about it. The church need those individuals to display this critical gift. When we look at, uh, for example, Acts chapter, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 10 is where we find the mention of this gift. But then in Acts chapter 5, let's go to Acts chapter 5 to see this gift at work or on display Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 3 to 6. And it reads, Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you have received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. We need the discernment of spirit to be able to decipher or distinguish between liars and truth speakers in the church because sometimes people are just telling some lies and we need some people with the discernment of spirit to call out some people and say listen man you have not lied to men but you have lied to God the Holy Spirit call you out yes so we need to ensure that this gift is at play right I see brother Marketer says the persons that discern the spirit are they prophets as well? Well, well Brother McIntyre, there, there is some amount of uh, um, prophecy there, but it is not prophecy as it relates to uh, foretelling, 
right? Or even forth telling. But it's, a, it's, about, it's about sensing that something is off. Something is false, right? The Holy Spirit is the one who puts it in you. It's not something that you can do on your own or at will. So like with Peter here, the Holy Spirit showed Peter that something was off about Ananias and his wife, right? That they were actually liars and that they were telling a lie, right? Let's, let's go over now to Acts 16. Let's look at this gift in action again. Acts chapter 16. And we're reading verse 16 to 18. So, so Brother McIntyre, I guess, I don't know if you heard me earlier when, when I contextualized it, right? That it is not just a gift of discernment. That it, it, is, it is more appropriately called the gift of discernment of spirit. So discernment of spirit or of spirit qualifies the discernment that we're talking about. So the idea of reading up somebody, for want of a better term or way of putting it, the idea of telling people what is happening in their lives, as we love to put it, that would more be of a prophetic nature. But the discernment of spirit is, is having that ability, that spiritual gifting, whereby the Holy Spirit enables the individual with the gift to distinguish between what is false from what is genuine, what is lie from what is the truth of God. Right, so I hope that it, it makes it clear to you. All right, all right, very good, very good. Right, so Acts 16 and verse 16 to 18. Now, the Apostle Paul is in action here. And it says in verse 16, Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future, right? So that's the, the spirit of divination, right? She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God. Was she telling a lie or was she speaking the truth? Of course she was speaking the truth. They were servants of the Most High God. Who are telling you the way to be saved? Was she telling a lie? No. All she said was true, but the nature of her utterances were of the devil. Right? And the scripture goes on to tell us in verse 18, she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the girl, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. So, so Paul recognized that this young girl was indeed speaking truth, right? But the origins of her utterances were not of God, but were of the devil. So Paul recognized it until he became so annoyed that he had to cast the demonic spirit that was influencing her out of her, right? So we need this in our churches. And, and, and 1 John 4 and verse 1 appeals for this gift. Let's read it very quickly. 1 John chapter 4. And verse 1, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So you see, Brother McIntyre, the person with the gift of discernment of spirit is not there in a prophetic role, but is there to test to find out those who are false prophets from those who are genuine oracles of God. So it is necessary because these days 
you know, with, with everybody being self-acclaimed prophets and everybody ready to read you out and read you up and everybody ready to tell you what is happening in your life and everybody getting a word for you, right? We need this gift in our churches so that we will be able to distinguish between and to be able to, to cast out and to tear down every stronghold that would have been set up in the church by the adversary with falseness or falsehood or non-genuineness to them. It is the gift of discernment of spirit that will enable the church of God to be able to pick up on these things. So the call is not for people who will be able to read up people and tell them what is happening in their lives. You know, you close your eyes and you say, boy, yes, I see one tall brown man. Mm -hmm. uh, he might trouble you. That's some obia man kind of something there. That's not what I'm talking about. Right? I'm not talking about people who want to hold your hand and read up your palm. That's, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. It's not tarot reading or palm reading that we're talking about now. We're talking about individuals with this genuine gift of discerning when spirits are not of God. When, when attitudes are off, when lifestyle is off and there is non-genuineness in the church, we need people with this gift to be able to identify and say, uh -uh, mm -mm, you're not right at all. You sit down. Stop talk. In the name of Jesus Christ, like Paul said to that young girl, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. Right? We need this gift so that some people will know to hold them corners because they know that if they ever rear their ugly heads, somebody is there who will pick up on them right away and will put them in their places and so they will remain uh, or hold their peace. So we need it. We need it. And we're going to pray for it. So tonight, brothers and sisters, we have the gift of administration. We have the gift of apostleship. And most critically, the gift of discernment of spirits. We want to pray that the Lord will reveal these gifts to us. Make them manifest so that they can be seen in action. Because we want the church to remain the church of God. Where people can grow, where people can, can find love warmth and a genuine sense of belonging and can feel within themselves that they are indeed in the right place. We want people to get uncomfortable as well. We want some people to, you know, to be at home and wondering whether to come to church and say, you know what, me now I'm go. Right? Because somebody can pick me up right as I walk through the door. Right? You know, back in the day, you know, this gift was, was on display more often than not. Not to say that everybody that were, were, were saying stuff in light of, of this gift or in that vein were genuine themselves. Because a lot of times people would know stuff about people, would, would hear things about people, right? And use that as the basis. But it's not the non-genuine we're talking about now. We're talking about the genuine. And that is what we're going to pray for. So that the Lord will have his way. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There, there, uh, there is a prayer request as well. Uh, Brittany Garwood. I guess this is the team that Sister Annie, I know I saw Sister Annie referred to, referring to uh, a teen who's supposed to do a surgery. Uh, her name is Brittany Garwood. Going to do a surgery on her back tomorrow and needs prayer. Hallelujah. I know the best back surgeon and specialist ever. His name is Jesus Christ. The one with healing in his wings. The one who speaks and it is done. The one who by his stripes gave healing, brought healing to the church and for the church. I know him as the balm of Gilead. I know him to be that healing balm that when we call on the name of Jesus, healing come to his people. So we're going to be praying for uh, young Brittany Garwood. A teenager shouldn't have to be doing back surgery. 
but we pray that the Lord will have his way and that Brittany will find healing and recovery easy as we trust the Lord for her. Praise the Lord. The Evans family as well. You want to remember the Evans and, and the Andersons at this time. You know, let that last week a special request was made, but I missed it. And, you know, I, I just want to publicly apologize. I, I just missed that one. But tonight you want to remember Sister Evans and her family in prayer. So we're going to be praying for these individuals. And we're also going to be praying that the Lord would reveal the gifts, the spiritual resources that he has blessed his people with, blessed his church with, so that we can utilize them, not for any personal glory or for vain glory, but for the glory of God. Let us pray. Everyone, wherever you are, as long as you know the value of prayer, please join me in praying for these matters. Father, we thank you for leading us tonight by the Holy Spirit into your word as we look at the resources, the spiritual resources that you have given to your church. You didn't leave us empty-handed. And Lord, every believer is guaranteed at least one gift. Oh, what a church we would have. What a community of faith we would have if every believer would seek to explore their area or areas of giftings and would seek to utilize such to the glory and honor of your name. It helped the early church significantly. And Lord, we know that it is what we need today. Lord, this evening we looked at the gift of administration. Lord, the gift of apostleship. And critically, the gift of discernment of spirits. Lord, you know, O oh God, in your own wisdom and providence, what is needed in the Sandy Bay Church, what is needed in the other churches where your people have fellowship and where they call home. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to identify these gifts among us and within us. Lord God Almighty, to unearth them, Lord, to not neglect them, but, O oh Lord, to use them to the glory and honor of your name. Not to abuse them, Lord, not to use them to lord ourselves over others, to belittle others, O oh God, or to, to identify ourselves as being superior to others. But, Lord, may we be guided by grace, your grace, and humility, God, so that we will utilize that which you have given us only to your glory and to the benefit, to the edification, to the maturity, to the growth and development of your church. Lord, tonight we present to you, oh, young Brittany Garwood. Lord God, you were aware that she had to do this surgery. Lord God, this surgery is not a surprise to you. Lord, you are not worried now. You are not running around wondering what is it that you're going to do. But Lord God, provisions have been made beforehand for Brittany Garwood. Lord God Almighty, Lord, oh, anything that falls short or of a miracle right now, a divine miracle from you that would see her not having to do this surgery would demand that God, you would have already impressed yourself upon the surgeons upon the specialists that will be performing this surgery lord god oh even those responsible for the anesthesia lord god those who would be assisting lord those who will be doing the preparation for surgery those god who would be dealing with oh the patient after the surgery you would have already put everything in place so god tonight all we are doing is responding to you in faith in our prayers and telling you thanks God for bringing Brittany through this. Lord God for carrying her through and for helping her to find success to the back issue. Lord remember the Evans family and the Andersons God. Lord you know their condition. You know what they're going through. 
Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bring restoration and revival and that, God, you would bring, oh God Almighty, all that they need to them right now. Lord, it is in your word. God Almighty, it is in the fellowship. Lord God, it is in our studies. It is in our time together, time spent with you and time spent with each other. We pray that you would grant them the comfort, grant them them the grace and the peace that they need at this time and oh lord an increase in faith to know that you god can take care of everything there is nothing impossible for you and so we continue to trust you lord with the activities of our church and with the activities lord of our lives be glorified be magnified pour out your blessings upon everyone on the platform tonight but everyone that will watch via YouTube, Lord God, and be glorified, God, in our praise, in our actions, even in our thoughts, for we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise tonight, in Jesus' name, and the church say, Amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Again, it was my pleasure. Looking forward to sharing some more with you next week, Wednesday, on the gifts of the Spirit. And I pray that this will not just be a knowledge-based session or series, but that you will find it to be of great help and will put it into practice and will, will go into the Word for yourself and will be praying to God to reveal to you your gift or gifts so that you can utilize them and bring glory to God and benefit, great benefit to the body of Christ. Uh, Auntie Winsome, praise the Lord. Heard that you, uh, uh, that Bermuda uh, suffered uh, the effects of a storm and that, you know, things were down for a little bit. But it's good to see you on the platform tonight. It means that you have internet connection. God is good. Praise the Lord. He has spared your life and the lives of many others in Bermuda. Continue to trust him and to win some. Uh, he's going to work everything out in accordance with his will and purpose for us. Praise the Lord. So next week, Wednesday, we meet again and we continue looking at the gifts. But then on Sunday morning, we meet for our usual Sunday morning service and uh, praise and worship and the word. So looking forward to have you. Looking forward to sharing with you those who cannot make it face to face. I'm sure you'll be joining on the Facebook platform and on YouTube. So God bless my brothers and sisters. Bear in mind that the, the ladies ministries uh, uh, prayer conference Saturday morning and the details have been posted on the Facebook platform to those who are yet to receive the details, the Zoom details, ID number and password. So it was my pleasure, not just sharing the word, but also praying with you and for you. Have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the rest of the night uh, and going into the weekend. Have a wonderful one. Praise the Lord. It was my pleasure and I'm out in five, four, three, two, one. Peace. God bless you.